Hello and welcome back to this uh, lecture 33 of bio microelectromechanical systems. Um, I would like to uh, briefly review what happened in the last lecture. Uh, we talked about micro mixers um, in details, parallel and sequential lamination mixers as passive mixers or active mixers uh, where there would be either chaos introduced or uh, some kind of piezo vibration so that there is cavitation or there is some active energy pumping into the system and there is mixing of two or more phases. We then detailed about micro valves, uh, essentially try to study some basics uh, about their actuation mechanisms, their performance characterization and also uh, specifications. So, some of the aspects like valve capacity, the leakage ratio, the power requirements, the, uh, the other aspects like material selection, biocompatibility, etc., were discussed for designing micro valves or micro valving systems. We further categorize valving into passive and active valving mechanisms, and uh, we discussed uh, different kind of actuation mechanisms like pneumatic, thermoneumatic, thermomechanical, electrical, magnetic, and some other actuation mechanisms. So, uh, we also uh, tried uh, designing some of these pneumatic and thermoneumatic uh, valving systems and saw that uh, especially the designs have to be made in a manner uh, which rhymes with the micro scale and uh, it kind of makes uh, uh, an area ratio, area ratio between the, the inlet and the, uh, the valve seat. So, that uh, the amount of forces that are needed for actuating the the valve member uh, is small. Okay. So, because we are talking about micro fluidic systems or micro flow systems, the inlet area is typically are small which makes automatically the actuation forces very, very small as we see saw in the example uh, about designing uh, these pneumatic systems. We uh, further uh, can mount a cylinder and use the uh, same kind of distributed load uh, by means of hermetically sealing the cylinder and adding temperature so that uh, the system has PDV work and uh, that applies uh, pressure on the walls and uh, effectively a force because of this heating effect. We also talked about biomimetic uh, passive valving mechanisms and tried to discuss about what happens to the human body particularly in the vasculature uh, with a pressure gradient um, and, and the way that the valves close and open. Oh, we talked about hydrogel valves here particularly where which are sensitive to pH and it swells and blocks or de-swells and unblocks uh, a certain flow and flow rates can be calibrated to the pH values respectively. Today we will be talking a little more on that line about uh, some other non-conventional valving mechanisms and one of the most popular in the category is also electrochemical valving mechanism. So, let us see what electrochemical valves really are. Uh, essentially a very simple system uh, of reaction as can be seen here uh, H2O is electrochemically uh, converted into hydrogen and oxygen and uh, basically if you look at the overall architecture of the system uh, this is basically the outlet of a micro pipe and this is a gating device here ok. And uh, essentially there are four electrodes in this region, this region, this region and this region and these electrodes pump in electrons so that bubbles get formulated. So, if you really control uh, the differential of uh, size between bubble 1 here and bubble 2 here, you can make this gate mechanism move back and forth. Okay. Suppose this is uh, bigger and this is smaller and the gate will push back, vice versa if this is smaller and that is bigger and the gate will push forward and so therefore, the flow path here is kind of blocked because of this mechanism. However, this is an electrochemical valve because hydrogen and oxygen bubbles here are produced just by virtue of pumping electrons ok, pumping electrons and so therefore, the valve is really operated or actuated electrochemically. Similarly, you could have um, a blocking mechanism wherein this is the bubble which is generated by an electrode maybe and the bubble is too big and blocks this port after a while and uh, uh, cuts off the flow from the inlet side to the outlet side. So, that is again called capillary force valve. There may be a tendency of the bubble to squeeze past it and go to the other direction. We ensure a pressure gradient between these two points so that the valve kind of 
uh, keeps here and protect, protects the flow from going from the inlet to the outlet side or stops the flow. So, that is how an electrochemical valve would operate. Uh, what is interesting for me to share here is that if we really look on a comparative basis between let us say a thermal setup which would generate the same bubble and the electrical setup which will generate the same bubble, you find that there is a lot of difference in the valving efficiencies and that is exactly why conventional uh, means are not very well suited on the micro scale and rather uh, you prefer doing something which is non-conventional uh, like let us say electrochemistry based or magnetic based or electrical field based to prevent uh, this extra amount of work which needs to be asserted for translating into the micro scale. Okay. Um, uh, so, so therefore, um, uh, we always fetch for rather non-conventional systems for uh, doing actuations in this scale. So, let us uh, do this example here, we have an electrochemical valve as we just described above which is uh, based on the principle of electrolysis of water uh, and uh, essentially here if you look into uh, we have to determine the energy required for generating an electrolysis spherical bubble with an approximate diameter of 28 microns okay. and uh, we have to compare it to a similar uh, bubble generating thermal mechanism uh, which generates by evaporation of water of the same size. Some parameters given are the specific density of hydrogen and oxygen at 1 bar pressure and 25 degrees Celsius, uh, it is uh, 0 0.08988 kg per meter cube and 1.429 kg per meter cube respectively. The surface tension of water uh, is assumed to be constant and uh, yeah, that is taken as 0 0.072 nanometers and the enthalpy of formation of water is about 285.83 kilojoule per mole and uh, some other thermodynamic properties of the liquid like uh, water like at, at 1 bar pressure like for example, the, the U or the internal energy at uh, 25 degrees Celsius that at 100 degrees uh, Celsius sorry this is the volume this is the specific volume. So, very, very one specific, specific volume at 25 degrees Celsius internal energy at 25 degrees Celsius and similarly uh, the specific volume at 100 degrees Celsius and internal energy at 100 degrees Celsius are given and uh, basically specific volume again let me reiterate as the units here indicate is volume per unit mass. So, you have uh, say 1 kg of mass of both uh, uh, hydrogen and oxygen or other gases uh, you really find out how this 1 kg would be able to occupy in terms of volumes. So, that is why I kind of uh, make a, a common base or a common denominator and see a volume comparison based on that. So, that is called specific volume, it is different than the normal volume, it is per unit mass or per unit weight. So, let us see what the differences really are uh, in terms of energy requirements and whether they are any different if it is thermal as opposed to electrochemical. So, let us first do the thermal, uh, the electrochemical part. So, if we assume A zero contact angle bubble, or let us say a perfect sphere, okay. There is no contact angle whatsoever. The pressure inside the bubble can be estimated as. delta p equal to twice sigma by r, sigma is the surface tension of the bubble and r is the radius of curvature of the particular bubble. Okay. In this case it is sphere, so it is essentially the diameter by 2. So, it is 4 sigma by h really and as we know from the example here the diameter of the bubble is approximately 28 microns which makes the radius about 14 microns. So, here uh, the surface tension force as we know is about close to 0 0.072 Newton per meter uh, for water molecules and uh, the radius of the bubble is about 28 microns which makes uh, the pressure gradient. So, this is essentially the internal pressure of the bubble. Okay. So, 
So, 4 times of 72 10 to the power minus 3 by 28 10 to the power minus 6. Okay. So, this comes out to be about 10 to the power 5 pascals or 1 bar pressure. So, uh, so all the properties are really defined at 1 bar. So, therefore, we can find out the specific density of uh, the electrolysis gas mixture of hydrogen and oxygen at 1 bar pressure. So, let us uh, go ahead and do that. So, all properties are defined at 1 bar. So, the specific density of the mixture of gases can be obtained as specific density of oxygen at 1 bar pressure and 25 degrees uh, Celsius times of specific density into 2 of hydrogen divided by 3. Uh, so, this comes out to be equal to 1.429 kg per meter cube plus uh, 2 times 0 0.089 kg per meter cube by 3 it is further about 0 0.536 kg per meter cube. So, that is what you know, the specific density of uh, the gases mixture is in this particular case. So, the amount of water required for generating the bubble um, uh, would be actually equal to uh, this uh, particular specific density times of uh, the volume of the bubble which is needed. Okay. This much amount of water if you assume a continuity between the two phases uh, would have to be essentially decomposed in order to create an equal volume of the gas mixture. H2 and O2 which would formulate a bubble. So, let us just write this presumption again here. So, the amount of water required for generating the bubble is m equal to v times of rho mix which is uh, 4 by 3 pi times of r cube times of 0 0.536 which is the density at this particular the density at this particular pressure and temperature. Okay. So, this comes out to be equal to about 6.127 10 to the power of minus 15 kgs. So, effectively you are actually electrochemically uh, converting about 6.127 femtograms of mass in order to get a bubble uh, which would have a pressure differential of about close to 1 bar. Okay. And uh, add that particular gas mixture density at uh, 1 bar pressure at about uh, room temperature about 25 degrees Celsius or so. Okay. So, with this uh, it is convenient to assume uh, in terms of number of moles how many moles of water would be needed uh, of so many kgs of water that has been generated here uh, to be electrolyzed for creating the bubble. So, the number of moles <coughs> In this case N will be equal to mass by mass of H2O which is 6.127 10 to the power minus 15 by 18 or about 0 0.34 10 to the power minus 15 kilo moles. That is how the number of moles of uh, uh, H2O molecules uh, would be needed to make a uh, a volume uh, which would support a pressure differential of about 1 bar. Okay. So, as we also know from the question here 
the enthalpy of formation of water if you see in this region and this is actually the electrochemical enthalpy of formation is actually 285.83 kilojoule per mole okay, of material and uh, we already know how many moles have to be made. So, the total amount of energy uh, which would be needed uh, for uh, making the electrolysis bubble essentially is nothing but this enthalpy of formation times of uh, the number of moles. And so therefore, if we write that down, we have the energy required for making the electrolysis bubble is essentially equal to 0 0.34 10 to the power of minus 12 moles times of 285.83 10 to the power of minus or 10 to the power of 3 joules which is also 97.2 times 10 to the power of minus 12 joules. So, effectively this much amount of energy is needed to realize uh, the total volume of the gas mixture in form of an electrochemical bubble. So, this is of course, the electrical energy this much energy has to be given externally through the electrodes to the water uh, for it to be electrolyzed and creating this gas mixture. Let us also compare uh, what would happen if instead of electrochemical means you have thermal mechanism to formulate the bubble. So, you have a change of phase essentially and that creates the bubble. So, let us compare what is the energy difference in both the cases. So, therefore, uh, if we compare the, the specific volume of water vapor at uh, 100 degrees Celsius and compare that with, with the mass in order to find out uh, how much amount of thermal energy would be needed to convert that mass uh, to make a thermal bubble, we should be able to have a comparative between uh, the total energies in both cases. So, let us say that the specific volume of water vapor at 100 degrees Celsius is about 1.673 meter cube per kg. Um, the mass of water therefore, m is also known is also given by V by nu the specific volume is essentially 4 by 3, 3.14 14 10 to the power minus 6 by 3 this is uh, essentially the volume of the sphere of radius 14 microns or diameter 28 microns which is the size of the bubble divided by the new value which is 1.673 this is essentially the specific volume of water vapor okay which is actually given in the numerical example the question at the very beginning so as you see here specific volume of the water vapor at uh, 100 degrees Celsius is given to be 1.673 meter cube per kg. Mind you, the thermodynamic state that we have to consider for uh, the, the bubble to be shaped up is that the water vapor essentially uh, is at 100 degrees Celsius which is also the, the boiling point of water. Okay. And uh, we need to formulate the vapor in order to realize the bubble. So, therefore, all specific volumes etcetera uh, which are considered really are uh, at 100 degrees Celsius. So, let us uh, try to look at that figure here and uh, see what the mass uh, would effectively be. So, in this case the mass comes out to be about 6.867 10 to the power minus 15 kgs uh, and uh, essentially if you ignore the heat losses uh, from the system we assume that the system is uh, hermetically sealed again we can find out the energy required, the thermal energy required for formulating this amount of water vapor mass 6.867 10 to the power minus 15 kgs of water vapor mass. So, how do we do that? Uh, we know that delta U thermal, the amount of internal energy that needs to be supplied for converting a, a water sample from 25 degrees Celsius all the way to about 100 degrees Celsius is also given as the mass 
that is needed to be converted in kgs divided by uh, the internal energy at 100 degrees minus internal energy at 25 degrees Celsius. And uh, if you look back in the example both these values are given here as uh, internal energy at 100 degrees is about uh, 2506.5 joules and that at 25 degrees is about 104.88 kilojoules per kg. And so we are multiplying the mass in kgs so we are left with this equation which is in kilojoules of energy. So we reduce this to 6.867 10 to the power minus 15 times of uh, 2506.5 minus 104.88 times 10 to the power of 3 joules ok. So it comes out to be 1.64 10 to the power minus 8 joules uh, and so essentially um, that is uh, the amount of thermal work that is needed to be done for creating uh, this particular bubble uh, in this example. If you may compare this value with the electrochemical energy which is needed it is almost uh, 4 order of magnitudes uh, more uh, in the electrochemical sense it is about only 10 to the power minus 12 joules whereas in the thermal sense it is about 10 to the power minus 8 joules. So the thermal means of, of course is about 10 to the power 4 times more than the electrochemical uh, means and so uh, definitely uh, you can understand which one is a better or uh, you know a more energy efficient process. So let us also compare the, uh, the efficiency by uh, considering this bubble uh, to have done a work of expansion and uh, trying to compare that with the amount of energy that has been uh, given into the system in terms of the work done and the internal energy change ok the total energy which has been given to the system. So if we do that we can get a comparative and uh, we will compare both cases the electrochemical as well as thermal and see which one has is a more energy efficient process in terms of uh, what is going in and what is uh, getting formulated it is a result of it. So let us say that uh, in both cases uh, there is a work of expansion which is uh, done by the bubble. And this work is essentially integral PdV also uh, this varies between 0 and 14 microns of course and you have uh, a delta P here and the pressure difference is about 2 sigma by R times of the elemental volume as I had done way back uh, before in case of spherical symmetry is given by 4 pi R square dr you can consider this by uh, creating the volume between r plus dr and r an elemental volume between these two components. So, you have r plus dr cube minus r cube and this effectively boils down to 3 r dr times of r plus dr the r cube goes off dr cube is too small and goes off or dr square here goes off you are only left with 4 by 3 pi times of 3 r square dr uh, and uh, that is essentially 4 pi r square dr. So, that is the elemental volume dv ok. I am just trying to recall what we did earlier in one of the examples earlier ok. So, let me just rub all this before we start with the, the derivation of the total amount of work which is done. So, the work done in this case is of course delta p dv uh, which is essentially equal to 2 sigma by r times of uh, 4 pi r square dr ok and uh, this varies between r uh, between 0 and 14 microns and uh, if you calculate this expression here with the sigma value which is already given in the uh, numerical problem as 72 10 to the power of minus 3 Newton per meter you are left with a total amount of energy or work done as 1.772 times 10 to the power of minus 10 joules ok that is how this uh, total work done uh, would translate into this is the PDV work mind you as the bubble is expanding against an internal pressure of 2 sigma by r and uh, we assume the r to be variable here the amount of work that 
uh, the bubble would do in the process of expanding against that pressure or uh, expanding uh, against that delta p is essentially delta p times of dv uh, the, the change in volume. And so, uh, let us uh, uh, assume that uh, the efficiency of electrochemical production of the bubble process. So, electrolysis process in terms of bubble growth is essentially let us call it an let is the W work done divided by W plus delta U electrochemical which was in the range of 10 to the power minus 12 joules as if you may remember. So, this comes out to be equal to 1.77 10 to the power minus 10 divided by 1.77 10 to the power minus 10 plus 97.2 10 to the power of minus 12. Okay. Let me write this in a little better manner. Uh, so, it is 97.2 times 10 to the power of minus 12 and so this efficiency comes out to be roughly 1 point oh sorry 65 percent okay, if you just do this calculation here. However, uh, if you look at the thermal efficiency in generating the bubble let us call it n therm is equal to work done divided by work done by the small sphere times of the internal energy change by thermal means required for generating that amount of or size of gases which can cause the bubble to be about 40 microns in diameter. So, this would come out to be equal to essentially uh, one point seven seven ten to the power minus ten this does not change the work does not change in both cases plus uh, divided by one point seven seven ten to the power minus ten plus uh, one point six four times ten to the power of minus eight and this comes out to be equal to about one point zero six percent. So, there is almost a sixty times change in terms of percent efficiency percentage efficiency when you talk about uh, the difference between electrochemical and the thermal processes. Okay. So, definitely electrochemical processes are much more efficient than the corresponding thermal processes. So, let us look into another uh, form of valves uh, which is also known as the capillary force valves in the next uh, example here. Uh, this effect is called the electrocapillary effect and you have to really understand what that is. So, uh, you can call it several other names like electro wetting effect. Uh, and essentially uh, it, it happens because uh, the surface tension essentially changes between two immiscible conducting liquids or between a solid surface and a liquid just by varying uh, the potential difference between these. So, here as you are seeing uh, this is a uniformly distributed bubble with a double layer across it you have some positive charges coming here and some negative charges outside this bubble here. So, if you just apply a potential difference along this direction maybe. Okay. Uh, this is the negative end, this is the positive end. There is a tendency of uh, the charges to kind of redistribute and the surfaces suddenly come in more tension or less tension and depending on which side it is facing. In this particular case as you see uh, the charges kind of the negative positive charges kind of go back like this right. And uh, so, therefore, uh, there is a more uh, surface tension suddenly which comes in this particular domain here had it be negative charge inside the surface tension would have come in the opposite domain here. So, uh, because of that there is a tendency of this bubble to move forward and backward be just because of the change in surface tension. Now, this can be done electrically this can also be done thermally as I will show in the next uh, illustration where we are talking about thermocapillary effects. Okay. So, uh, what will happen here is that as we already know that there is a formation of an electrostatic double layer between any two surfaces. Now, this may be a surface of a fluid or a fluid or another fluid and uh, a surface and uh, if you change the electrostatic potential in this case between the double layers the surface tension between uh, the two liquids would become uh, sigma new value which is equal to sigma old minus the amount of capacitive energy that you are pumping into the system half C V minus V 0 square. V 0 is the initial value of the voltage at which the double layer exists and V minus V 0 is the differential change in the in the voltage which causes 
this uh, this non homogeneous charge distribution across the surface causing a differential tension c of course is the capacitance per unit area of the double layer okay and uh, v is the applied potential across the liquid interface so as a result of which there is a movement of this particular effect possible and suppose this is going to block a capillary you just need to ascertain that you apply a field in the direction of the capillary so that the bubble goes and blocks the capillary opening if you reverse the field the bubble comes out and lets the flow go out so this is essentially how capillary force valves would work with okay another very interesting example is uh, uh, the thermocapillary effect as you can see here and the same effect that has been done with an external field can also be done with temperatures so in this effect uh, there is a temperature dependence of surface tension which is utilized for moving the fluid around or from the valve around uh, which is essentially a bubble and the surface tension really reflects uh, the true state of surface energy of a particular uh, uh, structure maybe a bubble or you know an air bubble or a water bubble in oil etc so at a higher temperature uh, the molecules of the liquid moves faster and their attractive forces become smaller uh, because uh, uh, there is less boundation because of more kinetic energies and therefore the surface tension definitely gets affected and becomes lower uh, when the temperature is higher and there is a difference or a gradient in surface tension which would cause the bubble to move towards the lower surface tension the smaller attractive force causes lower viscosity lower surface tension on uh, the right side in this particular instance say uh, the temperature is hot as you can see right so this t2 here is much much more than t1 which is the colder side so the surface tension is lower here and this causes a pressure gradient across the bubble which leads the bubble to move from left to right so the bubble actually starts moving in this direction towards the hotter side because of the low surface tension in any case any body in this universe as you know always prefers to go from a high energy content to a low energy content surface tension is a surface energy parameter and so if the surface tension is lesser the bubble would definitely try to go towards the lesser surface tension uh, which is given by this temperature gradient between t1 and t2 so very interesting effects in fact there's a group uh, uh, at which works in making these bubbles uh, to flow around in microfluidics based on uh, these uh, differential heating however one constraint that such thermocapillary effect although it's an immensely useful effect in almost all situations but particularly in the bioassays uh, the problem comes because you know the time kind of temperatures that you were talking about uh, for uh, changing surface tensions are pretty high in the range of about 90 plus most of the biological entities uh, uh, do not survive this kind of temperature and therefore uh, especially for biological applications thermocapillary effect may not be that prominently used however the the electrocapillary effect is definitely or electro wetting is definitely a very widely used area uh, for bio mems uh, based applications so let us look at uh, now a different uh, paradigm altogether uh, which is uh, uh, the world of micro pumps okay and uh, essentially i would like to uh, describe here uh, some of the basic definitions about what micro pumping is i would like to categorize into different uh, mechanisms again there are passive and active micro pumps there are mechanical non mechanical pumps essentially um, and uh, uh, of course uh, their op actuation principles or operation principles are based on totally different physical properties or physical effects and, and so therefore uh, one, in, one, one important point to mention here is that whatever uh, technology has been developed for micro valving mechanisms can be very well translated directly into micro pumping. Uh, the idea is that if you have some kind of a peristalsis motion where you have a traveling contractile you could discretize that and make a set of three valves to do identically uh, in a particular sequence this uh, blocking action of flow at different points uh, to build up a pressure move along that pressure and release that pressure and again start building that pressure on a small channel so whatever mechanisms we have done for valving can be sequenced in a manner uh, so that you can make uh, those mechanisms to flow fluids around so micro pumps can be categorized based on the principles by which energy is applied to the fluids uh, they can be categorized as mechanical and non-mechanical and mechanical pumps include uh, classifications based on uh, the principles by which mechanical energy is applied okay so all mechanical pumps however are either categorized as a 
dynamic pumps or displacement based pumps. So, there is some moving component, some moving member, some moving membrane uh, which is in close proximity to the fluid that you are moving. So, that is why uh, they are dynamic and displacement pumps. Displacement pumps again is that when the energy is periodically added to the this application of force to one or more movable boundaries uh, of any number of enclosed fluid volumes and this results in actually a discrete increase in pressure along the direction of valving close and uh, the fluids keep moving that particular direction. So, examples could be check valve pumps, peristaltic pumps, valveless rectification pumps and I am going to go into detail principles of all these pumps just in about a little bit, uh, rotary pumps etcetera. These are some of the examples. Dynamic pumps on the other hand are where mechanical energy is con continuously added to increase the uh, fluid velocity within the machine okay. and uh, the higher velocity at pump outlet increases the pressure and uh, therefore, there is a back pressure concept which comes out in these kind of pumping mechanisms. Uh, such uh, mechanisms can be categorized into centrifugal pumps, ultrasonic pumps etcetera. Okay, so, now let us describe some of the non-mechanical pumps uh, or types of pumps. So, essentially as I told you before uh, these really add velocity to the fluid by adding momentum to the fluid by means of converting another non-mechanical energy form into kinetic energy. So, uh, while mechanical pumping is mostly uh, in the macro scale. Uh, uh, the second category discovers this advantages in the micro scale. Uh, there are various uh, forms of non-mechanical pumping uh, or there are various principles of non-mechanical pumping. It could be a pressure gradient driven flow as in surface uh, tension driven flows, electro wetting, uh, the Marangoni effect uh, which we uh, which I showed in case of thermocapillary valves uh, about uh, some time back. And also pressure gradient created by surface modification, you can create a hydrophobicity gradient uh, and that could help in transporting water towards the hydrophilic side from the hydrophobic side. So, that is one of the mechanisms, non-mechanical pumping mechanisms. Another is concentration gradient driven mechanisms like osmosis. If you have a charge concentration and you have detailed, uh, you have seen the details of such kind of pumping mechanisms before while doing electrochemistry. So, essentially semi permeable membranes surfactants they would cause uh, this kind of uh, charged uh, double layer along the surface in the solution and a diffused layer and this layer can help you to kind of uh, move ahead uh, the flow of fluids as a plug through channels. And there are some other ways and means of non-mechanical pumping electrical potential gradient is one of them. So, you have electrosmosis, uh, electrohydrodynamic uh, flows, electrophoresis, dielectrophoresis. These are all mechanisms where electrical potential gradient would be used for non-mechanical pumping. And then you have magnetic potential driven uh, micro pumps like ferrofluidic uh, pumps or magnetohydrodynamic uh, pumps. Essentially here as uh, you will later see there is an oil emulsion of ferrous particles which act as a plug and can be moved uh, as a piston for driving ahead the uh, meniscus of fluid. Uh, the, the magnetic uh, assembly is moved back and forth by using external magnets sequentially fired uh, in a manner so that it can move uh, uh, the magnetic plug back and forth. So, these are some of the non-mechanical bases of uh, micro pumps. So, you have uh, now categorized uh, pumps into displacement types, dynamic types, these are the two mechanical kind of pumps and then several other non-mechanical pumps based on varied pumping principles. Let us look at some of the comparative flow rates uh, of these micro pumps as illustrated in the figure below here. Uh, typically mechanical ones are the most flow rate ones. Uh, uh, you have a higher flow rate definitely in mechanical pumps. non uh, mechanical pumps are actually uh, low on the flow rate uh, uh, characteristics. Uh, that is because uh, the amount of uh, energy density that you may have to add per unit displacement uh, or per unit volume or per unit volume displacement of fluid is uh, comparatively um, higher in this case, the energy requirement is higher in this case. So, uh, if you look at uh, in terms of ml per minute um, or in terms of uh, flow rates of different pumps, the mechanical ones 
are categorized here onto the right side of this particular scale. Uh, this could include check valve based peristaltic micro pumps, valveless rectification pumps and I am going to describe these in just about a little bit. Uh, so, they are more based on the 10 to 1 microliter or mi milliliter per minute range high flow rate range. The other hand new pumping principles which are non-mechanical like, electro like electrokinetic pumps, electro hydrodynamic pumps, magneto hydrodynamic pumps and ultrasonic pumps they are more towards the left of this figure it starts from about uh, a thousandth of a mil per minute to all the way to about uh, tenths of a mil per minute or so. So, definitely um, as you see here the mechanical pumps are much more in terms of flow rates. Um, so, they can couple the energy or they can put really a high energy density to the flow for the flow rate to be higher. The novel effects however ha have lower amount of density that you can pack. It may be an efficient process, but uh, at a time you may not be able to pump that much density because of limitations related to properties of the materials which you are flowing essentially or the fluids that you are flowing. So, that is in a nutshell what uh, the categorization is in terms of flow rates. So, the parameters uh, which are most important to define specifications of micro pumps uh, are essentially the maximum flow rate okay, and quantities like maximum back pressure. And mind you the back pressure is developed because uh, you are constricting uh, the forward flow into a very small venturi or a very small outlet and definitely um, it is going to take the uh, some work for the pump to do for pushing the fluid through this small outlet and that generates a back pressure onto the system okay. And essentially whatever the pumping mechanism be it has to overcome uh, this back pressure by uh, the application of mechanical or non-mechanical energy and only then the pump can be a forward directional working micro pump. So, uh, so specifications of course would include maximum back pressure the pump power is very critical and also the pumping efficiency is very critical as you saw in the electrochemical case in case of valves uh, the electrochemical valve has more efficiency is about 65 percent in comparison to thermal which is only about close to 2 percent okay. Some other parameters for pumps are maximum flow rates that the pump can accommodate uh, which is also known as pump capacity. So, it is essentially the maximum discharge volume Q max uh, in terms of uh, centimeter cube per minute or per unit time delivered uh, by the pump assuming that there is a zero back pressure okay. So, if you are just uh, letting the fluid go into an open atmosphere uh, then whatever amount of flow rate can be generated is really the maximum flow rate that the pump can generate. You can also categorize uh, the pumps in terms of the maximum back pressure. Uh, it is also the maximum pressure that the pump can work against. It can still keep working if you keep on increasing the max the back pressure at a certain pressure it can fail to work or deliver fluid anymore. So, that is essentially the maximum back pressure that a pump can sustain. So, at this pressure the rate of flow becomes equal to 0 ok. So, let us uh, do some mathematical representation of how you can calculate uh, these efficiency factors. So, the best uh, factor that uh, is used here is the pumping head in terms of uh, the pressure head that is deliverable by the micro pump. So, let us say the pump head H uh, represents the net work done on an unit weight of the liquid on passing from inlet to uh, the outlet of the discharge tube ok. So, the H here is given by the Bernoulli's equation as uh, the height due to the pressure that is P by rho, uh, the height due to the kinetic energy U square by 2 G and the potential uh, function Z in the outlet side minus the same quantities here on the inlet side ok. So, this is essentially the difference in the inlet and outlet pressure heads and that should come somehow as H the outlet pressure being more. So, this is the pressure delivered by the pump. So, if, if you are delivering an outlet pressure which is more than the inlet pressure definitely there is a head addition while uh, the flow is going into the pump. So, assuming the static head at inlet and outlet as, uh, as 0 uh, really which means that you are you know you assume that the pressures on both sides are at atmospheric pressures and uh, the velocities really are similar on both sides you do not assume a velocity gradient. So, in that case uh, uh, the, the maximum height that this uh, particular s s configuration can accumulate or the pressure head that it can give maximum is uh, equal to uh, the potential at the output side minus the potential at the input side due to the pressure or okay, due to the position. So, if a pump is kept like an incline and z input is more than z output. Uh, output is more than the z input. So, there will be a definite head which 
comes because of that ok. So, uh, that is essentially some of the parameters uh, of the micro pumps which are considered for designing such systems. So, uh, based on the maximum flow rate of the micro pump, the maximum back pressure P or the maximum uh, pump head H max, uh, you can really calculate uh, the power, the maximum power that the pump can deliver ok. And as you know power is essentially nothing but uh, pressure uh, times of uh, discharge uh, by 2 ok, this is the average uh, power because uh, if we assume the, the discharge to be 0 and after application of the pressure head P by the pump uh, the discharge maximum discharge to be Q max, the average flow rate really is 0 plus Q max by 2. And so, pressure times of uh, the average flow rate is essentially nothing but the work done per unit time. Uh, you may remember that uh, pressure into volume or PDV is, is the work done in joules and uh, Q is essentially volume per unit time. So, essentially this is power, uh, the work done per unit time. So, the power of a pump here assuming P max to be the maximum pressure, uh, Q max dash to be uh, the maximum flow rate and assuming that the flow rate starts from 0 and gets this height as the uh, fluid passes through the whole pumping chambers or the pumping system. So, Q max by 2 effectively is the average flow rate. So, P max into Q dash max by 2 essentially is what makes the power. And we know that the pressure max is also represented by this height max uh, into rho into g. Uh, so, rho g h max Q dash max by 2 is what the pumping power is. So, based on this power equations we can define pumping efficiency as uh, the power that the pump actually uh, generates in terms of flows by the power that it takes in in terms of actuation. So, if you have certain power delivered inside or certain energy which is delivered per unit time inside the pump which causes the, the mechanical or the non-mechanical uh, actuation of uh, the fluid and uh, then it results in certain work done by the fluid flow against the pressure head etcetera. So, these two essentially the, ra the ratio between them would determine what is the pumping efficiency as to how much amount of energy which you are packing in is densified as uh, energy applied for flow inside the pump. Now, here is an example that I would like to illustrate. So, you have a thermonumeric system uh, of check valve pump uh, which delivers a maximum flow rate of 34 microliters per minute. Uh, there is a maximum back pressure of uh, 5 kilopascals uh, which is generated and uh, because it is thermonumeric you are essentially heating uh, the fluid. The heater resistor here uh, is about uh, 15 ohms and uh, the pump works with a symmetric square signal with a maximum voltage of 6 volts at 0.5 hertz. So, you have to determine the pump efficiency. So, let us go and solve this uh, particular example. Uh, so, we assume first or we calculate first the, the pumping power ok. So, the power of the pump is really equal to P max times of Q dot max by 2 right. P max here is about uh, 5 kilo Pascals that the total maximum back pressure against which the flow rate uh, has to uh, be working. So, 5 10 to the power 3 Pascals is what the P max is. Q dot max is essentially the maximum flow rate which is about 34 microliters per minute. So, I can write that as 34 10 to the power of minus 9 meter cube uh, divided by 60 for uh, the per second into 2. So, this comes out to be equal to about 1.42 10 to the power minus 6 watts that is what the power of the pump uh, is. So, considering only the active half the drive signal, uh, the dielectric uh, power. So, basically if you see here what uh, he is saying is that uh, you have a square wave or a square signal to operate with a maximum voltage of 6 volts at 0.5 hertz, uh, which means that for the other half cycle uh, the power is switched off to 0. So, it is between 0 and 6 volts. So, effectively the power cycle is only about half the times and uh, the total amount of voltage given is 6 volts in that case. The other half uh, which is about 
um, the, the remaining half uh, is about uh, 0 volts. So, it is a just a square pulse or a square wave which is given to uh, control the, the heaters for the pressure rise or the thermonumeric uh, uh, force which would close and open uh, the particular valve. So, so, the electric power input here which causes uh, the actuator power is half V square by R, V is 6 volts half because the half cycle is only the power cycle the remaining half cycles are uh, 0 volts. So, there is no power delivered essentially from the source into the, uh, the chamber the numeric chamber thermonumeric chamber. So, this comes out to be equal to square of 6 times 2 times 15 the resistance mind is about 15 ohms as has been illustrated in the example here. Okay. Uh, so, this comes out to be about 1.2 watts. So, that is what uh, the, the actuation power is. So, pumping efficiency is uh, uh, defined earlier um, is essentially the, uh, the power of the pump which we just calculated in the top divided by power of the actuator. Uh, this comes out to be 1.42 10 to the power minus 6 by 1.2 which is about 1.18 10 to the power of minus 4 percent. Okay. So, that is what the pump efficiency is it is pretty uh, low the, the pumping efficiency in this particular case. Thermodynamic effects in fact do not uh, really give a very lot of uh, a lot of efficiency because uh, and also they are awfully awfully slow their response rate is very slow. So, let us uh, now talk about the second uh, uh, kind of mechanism which is peristaltic micro pumps and I would like to show some illustration from one of the research modules that we have developed in our laboratory here. So, this uh, right here is uh, the example of uh, what a peristaltic pump would typically do micro uh, for fluid transport. So, uh, let me just reiterate peristalsis is uh, the motion of uh, a traveling contractor fluid due to a traveling contractile. So, if you think that you have let us say a silicone tubing or something like a flexible rubber when you are pushing this rubber from both sides and there is a fluid column in between the fluid is almost uh, going to be squished on both sides. Now, with these two pushed if you just uh, go along the pipe you are pushing the fluid along the directions of the two pushers okay. and uh, that is what causes pumping uh, to happen or pumping to occur. So, that is called peristalsis it is a traveling contractile. Uh, similar mechanisms take place within the human body where uh, intestines are uh, used to generate enough motion for pumping bile uh, out of the human system. Okay, so, uh, so, we can uh, use uh, this uh, uh, traveling contractile mode as a continuous one continuous process or we can probably discretize it which is more suitable for the MEMS architecture. So, what we have done here is that uh, uh, this effect has been successfully utilized to uh, control flow of uh, fluid motion and uh, that has been done by discretizing uh, the peristalsis action in this particular illustration here. So, uh, the device made is a three layer device with a layer at the bottom which you cannot see here, but it exists. Okay. So, there is a layer at the bottom there is a channel layer on the top and then there is a blister pocket which is on the top of all this and these blister pockets are all connected through an air circuit which is controlled selectively using a solenoid motion. And uh, the idea is that you actually inflate and deflate these blisters in a sequence, so that you can press uh, say for example, this region here which squishes out the fluid in both directions and uh, then after this uh, forward momentum is gathered you keep this closed, so that the fluid cannot rush back and uh, close on uh, the second. So, you, you start compressing the channel on the second. So, here the fluid cannot rush back this path is closed and the only forward direction momentum would be uh, implied onto the fluid channel. Mind you this green uh, layer here indicates the fluid channel and there is a layer on the bottom here which is the base or the glass substrate. And uh, then you can have valve 2 and 3 operated and the sequence can keep on rotating, so that the flow uh, picks up from here and goes all the way up to the outflow. These are some coin like uh, peristaltic pumps which have been developed. Um, these are pneumatic chambered based pumps and uh, 
essentially um, uh, these kind of shows a real uh, picture of uh, the fluid transport as you are seeing here this valve is slowly getting filled by the fluid okay and uh, this uh, valve is slowly getting empty because the fluid transports across this whole channel here through these blister pockets these are some of the pumps in action so the pumping rate uh, has been categorized in the range of about 10 to 12 microliters at pumping frequency of 10 hertz uh, which has been attained okay and the pumps are essentially three layer devices fabricating using glass and pdms pretty much in the manner that we had done blisters uh, in this case of course the orientation of these uh, uh, chambers uh, for pumping peristalsis chambers for pumping are different and they are energized by an off chip compressed nitrogen supply regulated through lab view. So, this kind of brings us to an end of this particular lecture and uh, next time I would like to analyze uh, the peristalsis effects in a little more uh, detail with numerical approach and try to see things like flow rates, back pressures, uh, pressure heads, heads which are attained by this peristaltic motion sequence. We will also uh, look into some of the other kind of passive uh, uh, pumps like valveless rectification pumps or centrifugal pumps or some of the some of the active pumps like centrifugal pumps etc. And uh, then we will try to go ahead and do some of the fabrication processes for realizing how these small scale devices can be realized as MEMS uh, using MEMS technology. Okay, thank you.